Molweni Tumelang San Bonani Kamalam Gunzikelelo Agwamazwai. It is a great pleasure and privilege to be here, Nama Africa Amahle, as we celebrate one of our matriarchs, one of the builders of Pan Africanism, Umam Zonde Nisumukwe. Um, as most of you know, today would have been her 95th birthday. We have got a formidable program, Namtlanje, with some powerful speakers. So I hope you get your pen and paper ready so you can suck in the information. Obviously, you know, we live in a patriarchal system where we don't get to celebrate our female icons. But today, Ponte Afrique and the Robert Sobuke Trust have made it possible. Uh, I think we're going to start with a video. I've got a lot of videos for you from people that experienced Umam Zondeli. So we're going to actually have some first-hand accounts. So let's Get it started with the first video. Thank you so much for joining us. Bamba, I know my pleasure. And then I don't, I want to go to my, get up with some bodies. Whatever, oh, my mom, so we keep our own kind of a big easy. Look, yeah, messy. Oh, baby, I'm Yamazella, Mamma, who name a prof. Mamma, I can uncle, but Anga mind don't get a jack and name. Cobo wouldn't see my baby, baby, who la cobo. Be bambe, name Mamma, who name a prof. Oh, who wouldn't see my baby now? I'm very good at down, put that to touch you with a bamboo is all. Touch you where I have where the office is in Kulu. <laughs> I hope my sound is better now. Thank you to everybody who's joined. This was a book trust. Um, o Prof Gordon Zide. Uh, I'm gonna hand over to him. I don't want to waste anybody's time. I know we're here to suck in the energy. Prof, greetings. Okay, uh, greetings, um, Nziki. And uh, uh, thank you very much for agreeing to facilitate uh, this session. Um, as it I know he was having network problems early on, but I'm learning now. Yep. Hi, yeah. Can can you hear me? Am I audible? You are audible, Lengos. We can hear okay. you. You can go ahead. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are, as the Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe Trust, we are indeed uh, humbled and honored to have arranged this uh, memorial lecture in honor of Mama Zondeni, Veronica Zodwa Sobukwe. And we also want to thank our project manager, Tando Sibuye, for what he has done since joining the RMST. We're celebrating today the life and times of Mama Zondeni Sobukwe, somebody who the pre exilic uh, government tried to eviscerate and obliterate. But due to her patience and perseverance, and indeed her spirituality, she was able to overcome the brutality of the apartheid regime by consistently writing to the powers that be demanding the release of Professor Sobukwe. They tried their best to frustrate her. But because she was a spiritual woman, she nonetheless survived. And one would have expected, I believe, that 
with the post-exilic era, things would have been totally different. But where we are today, we seem to be experiencing the very opposite, something that Mama Subukwe would not have appreciated. And I think and I believe that she would still be using her mighty pen to challenge the status quo. And it is, it is indeed not a matter of, you know, for the PAC, what's the space in 2024? It is not a matter of quantity that we should really be big in numbers, but it's a matter of quality. We have quality in the PAC, quality which exemplifies um, Dada Robert Sobukwe's uh, ethical leadership as well as Mama Zondeni's ethical um, leadership and indeed, you know, skewered leadership. And it is because of these aspects of um, her life that um, the RMST felt that it cannot be that the 27th of July would go by without us having recognized the kind of leadership we had in Mama um, Sobukwe. As I welcome you all, uh, colleagues, I just want to share with you that even though we now have a democratic space, but it is really worrying that many of the things which Mama Subukwe fought against will seem to be the order of the day. Corruption, Qaeda redeployment, state capture, poor health facilities, poor education, no roads, and South Africa is really in a, in a chaos. It is indeed a disrupted society. Hence William Gumede in his book of um, 2002, the page of the book, he says, and I quote, our rainbow nation has become a restless nation. Citizens are faced with poor service delivery and corruption. And corruption infected both politics and businesses, close quote. It is such unethical behavior which um, Mama Sobukwe fought against. And indeed, one would have expected that with the post-exilic uh, period, things would have changed. But lo and behold, not. Mama Sobukwe was the embodiment of the PAC's dictum to serve, to suffer, and to sacrifice. And, and, and so it is really encouraging for these Africanists who are here today to celebrate Mama Subukwe's who would have been 95th the birthday. But without much further ado, I did indicate earlier that she was a spiritual woman, a woman of prayer. You know, the last time that um, I spoke to her, when we were in Hrafrenet, just before, you know, she passed on, because last year I, uh, I, I published a book and we launched it. And um, thanks to Le Wang um, and Mohau, you know, they were behind the uh, launch of the book. She said to me, when I asked her, Mama, what exactly kept you, kept you going during the dark days of apartheid? And he, she looked at me and said, by the way, you are a preacher just like my husband was. And says, you know, in the Tosa hymn books of the Methodist Church, hymn 206 reads thus, Ngogo ndinga ndingamba nawe ngoseno fefe, nduwa nyuka makrina, and so the loose translation is, therefore, I would wish I can walk with you, thy gracious Lord, to climb the hills and the valleys of the shadows of darkness. That was 
so much Mama Sobukwe's belief that they can, they tried, you know, to break my soul. They tried to break my heart, but because of this belief, as well as the support that I got from my biological family, as well as my political family, which is my political home, the PAC, I survived. And even now, I am still going to survive. And so we say, well done, colleagues, and um, thank you. Enjoy the platform, and the stage is here, is yours, is related to. Thank you, Nsigi. Thank you so much, Mo Africa Professor Zide. Thank you so much for, and also thank you to Mangaliso Sobukwe Trust uh, for the moment where the lover is celebrating the other lover's birthday. I think we should move on to another video. Thank you everybody for joining us. Over to Technical for a new video. Na pabi kukindo zika sonu kuzipa. Yendi yendi baase babo. Ufoto zika sonu zika sonu zika sonu zika sonu zika sonu. Apeha funa lapa e ekali. Uba kulotuwa umama magatete izu ito kubela. Jengba sisonde le. Kimini yosa alwa kama musumu. Ngele pigizu umama ayawu tumela. Apekali. Atu infan ba umama musumu kubela nga teta ala. Mama Sobu Kabena Len felt at her time. At man, I wish Bandi Babanda said. Sibeno Mama Abaza Tunga, Sibeno Mama was a Kusha, Sibeno Mama was a Quinton to his tea. Sifundi Sani, a one a white yellow. What in Jenga won of Rango Sins as in was in Jenna in a camele. Sifun and Jenda one. But I soon do the ending at the time of Banga Kubeka Banda. See, Sabule, Goska, Goska. Say, Bakele, and Mabba Gibante, Maboka, you might say, Oh, my God, one Indeed, how you live your life is your legacy, Sabule. Um, next on the program, we have Umam Nonobe. Who's going to do a tribute and rendition? And she's from the craft. Ngela Tesha, 1954. Ushubet, umfene, umkulu. No angelina, umbono kazi. Bakutia, ikama, elungu no samu. Paya gulamzi wabu. E 464, Sobukwe Street. Apa, e khrafrinet. Bebe kutwesa kentomu ya semzini. Isi tsaba. So unanga kazi. Ikawe kazi. Ikoha kazi. Eli vumba. Vinge na sipelo. Lona li vakala kukumnandi malo. Na seku sitele ni kwako. Indezani. Ibisonga. Ngomutule. Na kukusele. Ikinga ikamva elikakambileyo. Ngenzo ndelelo. Ngotando. Nonyamezelo. Ugushe. Obunga kundiyo. Intombeche. Ekanya okwenkwenkwezi. Itela kufa. Ikhoti kasi. Mweke. Kodwa. Ugusisi kuku kasi. Mbogu pele, nengatalo, apa ema mfeni, ko shati, ko jambase, ko kanzilisa, o sanzanza, ape shangomfa eliweni, bepana ngezanja, 
akakamba akakamba kwa vela nelo mshati izini from Cape to Cairo ade suti akulo nono belisa emorija then jenje then jenje ya ukuti shala It goes, Mama. You know, if the spirit of Umam Zondeni was not here yet, now it's here. <laughs> Mama. Thank you so, so much for the rendition. Uh, we are broadcasting live on Facebook at Sobuka Trust. No, YouTube, Point the, point the Politique. You know, it's these people that use these French names when we're African. But you know how to spell it, ne, guys? Point the Politique. Please shout out engage with the topic i know you guys may not be familiar no mom zonde any ask your questions so that the speakers can speak to your issues i'm going to put on another video now we're building it up nicely i'm building it up nicely we've got a keynote address from so please stay tuned and enjoy do engage with us on facebook thank you over to technical Tubona ni hancho la ngama ni leka sababu ni nene nje. Ulo misi waka soko. Nyake ndingu uma mwa ita soko. Walapa ekhaf. Ndongi ya salila epai. Koda kukutate ya balapa ya kule la apa ekhaf. So ndi ya kuya mwini bwana ndi hancho la ngama. Banda ba seta ngaka. Kutimuluini. Mwala mama. Sabulela kwa mama wazazisa. Umama umazinjani umo msumu. Uma mwe sobu kwe, ufi ya kwa ke apa ekhafu. Uma mwe sobu kwe kala wafi ya kwa 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 umye ni wake. Kwa 1978. And then zanga shale presidente, wangu mwe upinde uya hamba, uya bangu mtu ose Alice. Kwa uma mwe ke ebu ya from e Alice, uma mwe wabala apa ekhafu. Waba plenhu ya kwa sobu kwe, apa sobu kwe street. Wathala kona. Mte ekhala apa uma mwe sobu kwe, Ingu mama nje ndi mbazi ndi mbole mama sema mfeni ni kuwa na mdi mbamfeni. Mako na ke ota ba oba ababini. O mama nopo ndi abanga sister baka tatu sobu kwe robot sobu kwe. Bona abate bama zisa umamu sobu kwe. Kum panda zisa namu umamu sobu kwe. Kazu ba ufaida ndo mbi ya sema mfeni ni. Ewa tala kakulu ama mfeni. So mamu sobu kewa wangu mdu gengu huku, ondi tanda ayo, ondi kabisa ayo, esi na zange sasukana na mamu sobu kwe. Ibi mdu onja ni mamu sobu kwe, apa ekhalini na lapa ekhafu? Mamu sobu kwe, eku mazini kwa mamu sobu kwe, oku wafika ayo apa ekhafu. Uteka emuwe la kwindu yake ya sektawun, mamu sobu kwe wangu mdu, o e ati asebenzi si amna ngamata cha onge kubanda ndi ngumuto onengwe nchini kubela mukwang ba yenga tando ba a ambena ngai pina na imoto ba tando ba esolo kwa e amba na ngamata cha onge na kwa e amba kaka juu shabu zake kubanda abas Thank you very, very much. Uh, next on the program, uh, we've got a, a Mo Africa veteran, a PAC veteran, Professor Shavadada. I'm looking forward to your contribution. Um, Prof, are you there? Are you ready for the youth? We want to drink yeah, from CD. I'm available. I'm available. Do you hear me? <laughs> Do you hear me? Well, we can hear you. It's perfect. Thank you. Well, let us start. Uh, I will begin by thanking the Subway Trust Foundation for organizing this commemoration of um, the commemoration of the life of Mama. Zondeni Nosango Mateso Bugu. My approach to the discussion is going to be structured this way. 
I'll first look at the area that what I will call the division of human effort in engaging in activities that are aimed at dealing with the issues of humanity, in this case, dealing with the issues of African people in this country. I will then be in a position to say there are different levels at which people enter in this regard. And when they enter at these different hierarchies, at the same time, they bring with them their values. They bring with them the value propositions as to what sort of social order they would like to see happening in their respective uh, countries. Then I will be in the position to move on and then identify as far as I could and I can see as to what way the hierarchy at which Mama Zondeni operated. I'll also look at the values that she utilized, that guided her, and the values that you would have liked to see our society embracing. At the end, I'll be looking at each hierarchy at which she operated, and I will close by probably calling upon us all, first the Africans, the African people in general, to engage against what I will call the, um, the existence of coloniality in this country, which is really is a source of all our problems, and also argue that it's not just a question of democratic dispensation. We must problematize what sort of democracy do we have because there are different forms of democracy. That is going to be my area of approach as I hereby start. The division of human effort for transforming and bettering lives of humans in their various societies is predicated on the extent, size, and variability of the domain or arena where human life needs are transformed, developed, and stabilized. In this regard, therefore, we can say the agents will choose their mode their approaches, their engagement, or participation, values, and value proposition they bring in at the particular chosen areas of their engagement. Mamaso Zondeni, um, in terms of the efforts and in terms of the fields at which she operated, I will identify them as follows. It was at a family level, at a community level, and at a national level. And I will propose and indicate that as far as I'm concerned, the values that she utilized in this engagement were as follows. These were the very rules of humility, empathy, modesty, and avoidance of glare and fanfare in the activities she was engaged in. We should therefore say she looked at the family, children, and a husband at that level of the family hierarchy. She enabled Mangaliso to concentrate uh, his efforts at the national liberation leadership level for the emancipation of the African people. 
She did this all as described by Sobu himself, I quote, ever dignified, calm and cool, ever uncomplaining and never queening, end of quote. Also, Mangaleso acknowledged her dignified manner of engagement with family, communities, and at national issues as follows. I quote, I have come to know what a great woman you are, the true embodiment of African womanhood, end of quote. You will recall, of course, that the PAC 1959 manifesto advocated right at that time for the dignity and respect for the African womanhood. At community level, she was a pioneer of healthy well-being of the African people. Their development, their empowerment as individuals, families, and communities. The health of the people at physical, mental, and social level was his approach in this regard. The health well-being of the African people, as far as she was concerned, had to be attended to at the following domain. The lifestyle and social services domain, the economic domain, the cultural environmental domain, and the social domain. This is to say, therefore, when we look at the health well-being of, of the people, of a people, those domains are critical. You would not be in the position to deal successfully and completely with the health livelihood requirements of the people if you negate any one of those domains. Now, with regard to the geographical areas where she operated, these will include, of course, Soweto, Kimberley, Alice, and Kafrine. At the national level, colleagues, she supported her husband, as I've already indicated, Mangaliso, enabling him to play his leadership role for the liberation and emancipation of indigenous African people. And she also supported her husband as a political prisoner and detainee, as well as other political prisoners. She herself participated at this level, as we could find uh, as quoted in the info as follows. I quote, Unko sigazi sobuge kwinte toyake ukutaze ama kusigazi uguba asoloke enyamene nabaye nibao ekuzabalazini inkululeko ye azania. End of the quote. This is Invo of March 18, 1968. This therefore indicates to us that not only was she supporting her husband to play the leadership role at that arena, that level, but she was also a participant. But as we have indicated, she approached her participation with humility, modesty, simplicity, and as much as possible, avoidance of glare and fancy. Um, at this level, Ezekiel Mpatlele had this to say, I quote, you were there 
with Mangalisa Sobuwe, mother of Africa. Ever ready for him to draw the Riga Sanka from the family warm. You were there with him, daughter of Africa. We salute you, daughter of Africa, devoted wife and mother, who can pay into ever glowing shrine. End of quote. The issue is turning pain into glowing strong. She served as the political courier between her imprisoned husband and the presidential council in Maseru Lesotho, which was headed by P.K. Libalo, and I was there. May I take my personal encounter with Mama Sobube. In 1964 in Maseru, at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, when I was suffering from my pains and etc., I heard people say, you have an important visitor. When I looked, it was Mama Sobuwe. She had come to see us at the hospital, having been injured from the bomb that was placed by the rest of security forces in TK Nibalo's car. And we suffered immensely. But what was important to me in that regard was I asked myself as to who legal am I that the mother of the powerful leader of the powerful PAC has come to the hospital to see me, to console me, to advise me how to manage my pain and to give me courage to move forward with the struggle for the liberation of the African people. Again, this is the person that entered the arena of her efforts within the hierarchy with humility, simplicity, as I have already indicated. She came to Durban at one time and I and my wife Esther used to visit her frequently at her family home at Claremont here in Dublin. And we used to make sure that her requirements for upkeep were, were met. And we did organize for her a come together so as to enable Ama Africa around this area to come and see their mother and their leader. And indeed, fortunately at that time, the late Loretta Ngobo was around and she managed to be with her. After that, she summoned me and uh, my wife to come down to class and she said, Design Ms. Obega is in Mabini Gata and Gaza needs a Ms. Obega Leluni. And indeed, we had to do so. Thereafter, we were almost on a daily basis uh, in contact with her. And uh, she used to call my wife Umako Tuwane because not only was Mama Zondeni ready to assist and help other people. She was highly appreciative of anything that somebody has done for her. 
zomuzwa ethi ah ubani unobubele ah ubani unobubele she used to be so grateful the little that we thought we had done was highly appreciated with her, by her sometime when she was in the hospital there at Kraft, I got a call from Vinile Caesar, a sacrifice of the nation. And he was saying, I'm in here at the hospital with my mom. And Vinile started crying. Then I became a bit taken up, thinking that something wrong was happening with mama. But Vinile said, no, I'm crying, looking at my mother. And I remember how my mother looked after us, sacrificed us. And he says specifically, I remember the day we were to take buses from home back to Lesotho where we were uh, attending school. And we were running late. And my mother arrived, coming from work, still in her uniform. And she merely picked up our big uh, uh, box, those iron uh, 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 boxes which were carrying books, food for students that were boarding. She took it up and put it on her head and started marching straight to the bus station leading us ahead without having to sit down and change her, her uniform. And people were looking at this stuff mess carrying this big box with her uniform and marching, looking, going to ensure that her children got in time to the bus in order to enable them to go to Maferu in the city. That is the person that we are dealing with. That is how she operated at the hierarchies, as I have already indicated. Those are the values she brought in as well over it in the paper as well 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 as I've already indicated that it is important for us to realize the sort of situation we are in. The, our country has not been liberated in terms of what the Africans had hoped to be liberated. We normally try to place it technically by saying Secular colonialism moved into neo-colonialism and operated under the conditions of coloniality, which will represent, therefore, that whilst the administrative structures of the racist system were supposedly removed, but the critical economic, cultural, knowledge and skills, areas of our society remain still colonized and under the same forces. Who, of course, as before, the colonial system operated both domestically and uh, globally as part and parcel of the imperialist system. So what we're saying in this country, what was said to be democratic dispensation, my food, was nothing else plus the uttering in of the coloniality period, the neo-colonial period, the further, in, uh, in, uh, uh, further would call it the further um, and freedom condition 
a better oppressive system for our people in this, in this country. Therefore, we will say that democracy, liberal democracy, procedural democracy, is merely an attempt to pluck the dark feathers without the dark feeling the pain. It provides for us no empowerment. It provides for us no liberation, culturally, economically, and otherwise. And what we need, therefore, is indeed substantive democracy that will ensure that African people are empowered economically, culturally, socially, institutionally, and in all real respect. And they are indeed in charge of their situation. We therefore will call upon the African precariat, African proletariat, semi-proletariat, peasants, semi-peasants, African professionals, academicians, etc., that it, this is time to get themselves sufficiently mobilized under the right leadership for the new thrust for the destruction of the coloniality system that exists in our country. We should be in the position, my Africa, sons and daughters of this continent, we should be in the position, among other things, to recognize and to realize our national sovereignty that goes hand in hand with the control of the territory, the land, the resources of the country by the decolonized African people. For instance, as a matter of fact, the land of this country should be a common property of the African people. The land of this country must be decommoditized so that it cannot be subject to buying and selling, but it must be made available to the African people for use. These are the critical ingredients of what a liberated Azania would definitely look. We should therefore continue to endeavor to make sure that what Sobu, what Mama Zondeni, no sango, the gate, not just the gatekeeper, but the gate itself. Their goals and what they stood for and what they died aiming to achieve is achieved. And this what they achieved by us. The youth of this country, the students of this country, the plasma forces of this country, should be in a position to identify, among other things, what's their role in the total onslaught. It's not just a question of decolonizing education. Yes, it is. But it is a question of what sort of social order should exist in this country. And this social order will be shown, obviously, or demonstrated, or represented by the economic, social, cultural, institution, etc., of the society, the purposes of our society, the functions of our society, which are all aimed at nothing else but to ensure that the life, the livelihood of the African people, their sovereignty, their enjoyment of life, without having to be dependent on other people, is realized. The country, as I've already said before, the country has turned up, is being turned into a Peru, a Haiti. We see forces of various forms and, and formations engaged in the destruction of the country, pitting African groups against African groups, families against families, making us every day to be mourning and to be burying each other. So that at any given time, 
we will not be in the position to consolidate our unity against the, primary, the primordial uh, enemy of the African people in this country. We are being occupied with nullity, with destruction that are aimed at making us engage in the nullity and not be engaged in the areas that are critical for the emancipation of countries. I declare, therefore, my Africa, this country is not emancipated. This country realizes what at some time I call a halfway level of decolonization. We have not concluded, we have not arrived. And indeed, we need to arrive. And the role of institutions like the Sobuke Trust will therefore be making contributions in organizing such discussions because it is through such discussions that we shall engage each other, fortify each other, provide each other with the directions of what needs to be done. With those few ways, I thank you. And mostly, we are so thankful that your generation of dinosaurs is adapting to these online lectures. You're not getting left behind. So we're really thankful that we can continue to drink from your well of wisdom. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to our last video for a keynote address. Thank you again, my Africa, for joining us. We've been so privileged, actually. So, you know, um, shout out to everybody uh, watching us live on, on Facebook. Okay, technical, we can check out the video. And a very happy birthday to our Mama, Uma Zinjani, Uma Musobukwe. Uma Musobukwe. Um, um, Robert, Charles. Charles, brothers. Eh, okay. Charles, so apa eku kuli ni kukama mayena kula emazi kanyo mame na waka luti bana njani no mamu sumu kwa eno kule emazi mamu sumu kingu mdo njani no hitu mbuso wako o o o e kule ni kwa mu umayu no tayo mwena bandwana yodi fike la paha peso kwa sumu kwa but ese ala ya kwa so kendi mazi njalo kumayu and very strict. Uno time. We are omye umtu ya kwazo keta nomye umtu. Apa kubu strict bagi. If you know into Mamma, I come by. They can know about Peter and I get it. I feel good strict team back. As I didn't call in no man. Jay visit. Shall be Jim for a day. And then we are that same day. So up a cuckoo boot to Louis PC. And a woman may go, your mass by white. A pin de manoba white, he was a la pacum boot. Man, I can't Jingum Lingani, a dad, Moscotua, Ndom Tata, a source of an umbone yet. I like a feeling of Dom, and I, why a call, and I go mine. 
So when it comes to apa e kutwa bengu mungi kazo ma. Yeah. So ngei peyo nando no babe yenza. No ba ukwenza show indo baba nba sekhafu. Maybe ba ya mamkela. Kwisi si posa ke anaso ya. Emba nba sekhafu mos ba yungi. So ze bamke ze luta banga masi ya kon. So tinga chini wa ye ambi round to mine. E chonga ba like. Abantu be as a TV, jongi rounds on a smoke song about Ninja not in King Tom Tom. Abe Mam Kelum. Kutuma, my name, no me camp, no gany in do you chisabant. Like organization you chisabant, Sabane Kumbi. No sango, eh, no any Kumbu. Jane Banam, bomb so in fifty yak. Uba be sapina. No buma mutinga, no buma musubuke bengenza and do me for one basse half. Ebeza is amakrukas because Lombuto Wikisa amakrukas. So Ebeza, like for instance, there's a year when they birthday, and then remember amakrukas just for snacks, mm -hmm. yeah, God. Pa e esto ke substrat. Ba tutu wa tenga liku. Kwe zindo ziza ziza shayo apa e khaf. Abandu wa nabani nzibange neki drugs. Abandu wa nabani nzibange alcohol abuse. Mwe special manga ati specific e khaf. Manditi e South Africa. Kwa siya skumbulis kanye kwa besanda kwenze kwa mbuka pimond. So abandu wa fana numa musobuke. Uba bebe sa pila. Kwa mbuka numa gol pu chincho. Ewe kunzi mchinchu mtu. Kwa tana banga ulipu chinchu mipi. Ebeza uzama. Ebeza uzama. Ebeza uzama. Ebeza uzama. Ebeza uzama. Ebeza uzama. But the way they are going. The way they, that they are taking it's wrong. Because in the first place. Kau kula. Charity begins at home. So uzakla. Tata lemfundi soya lapenji. So again, Oko iwisi. Oko ya iwisi. Umama umaze mdoncha. Especially when it comes to a peka. Wele wele azu mamu tibe nga shala ke khafi kashe nizi. Oto na wabangelo migezo mina fike nga azu. Bimu mdoncha. Ebe si e kawe. Ebe nga poso e kawe. Ebe si e kawe. Thank you ma. Those are the words from Iskriza Aska Mam Zondeni. We are celebrating 95 years, Mam Zondeni. Um, you know, every generation has their own. As much as we are celebrating the elder generation's Kawigazi, we too have our own. And it is a pleasure to announce the keynote address from Oslebo Khang, Dio Belo Peko, also Mo Africa, and we are looking forward to the engagement always very very fruitful to hear from this lady so i hope your pens and paper are ready okay. hi hi sister ziki thank you so much for the warm introduction thank you my africa ama atlek yalilumi lisa kau fela yalimeri saka kajenu lena hovani kile tati lebo shlokwa I also want to call on um, the creator, the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to guide us, to come and to lift us, to energize us, to motivate us, to inspire us. Um, I call on the energies and the inspiration of the women warriors who have come before us, the ones who guide us and the ones who have continued to be our guiding lights and who have set the flames that are torches that light our path ahead of us. I want to call on the name of Nzinga Mbandi. I want to call on the name of Emily Bisrat and May Musa Sayeg, Nawal El Sadawi, 
and Latifa Zayed, so Jono Tooth and Harriet Tubman. I want to call on Tony Marison and Wangari Madai and Josina Michelle and Loretta Ngobo. I want to call on Mabel Dove and Ushari Mangena and Phyllis Ndantala and Dan Samkuti. And I want to call on Meba Lede Mazwai as well. Thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful occasion. Thank you so much for enabling us to remember that there was somebody called Mezondeni Veronica Sobukwe. Thank you for reminding us that she would have been 95 beautiful years on this day had she not transitioned to the next world, but we know that the worlds are concurrent, that she is with us in spirit and in memory even now. I want to also suggest that, in fact, Emerson Deni has so much to offer us, not just as a biography, not just as a wife, not just as a mother, although she was all of these things. I would like to suggest that she stands with the many women who migrated from our difficult concrete conditions, our difficult grinding conditions of revolutionary despair to light her own path and to set us apart and to set herself apart as a history maker and a her story maker. This was not a leaderless movement. This was a movement of women who were escaping from reserves, who were escaping from absolute poverty, the poverty of politics, the poverty of dehumanization, the poverty of dispossession. And finally, I would like also so to suggest that even though she has been named constantly as being silent, as being private, and as someone who is unknowable, even to those who know her and those who know of her work and who knew her and knew of her singular life, she teaches us so much in this supposed silence. So I offer us this day a celebration of her noisy silence, a celebration of her dissident strength. I offer a celebration of her transgression. So what is silence, Ma Africa Amatle, both in Azania and beyond? I want to speak about the silence, which isn't the silence that comes from fear, nor the silence of being told too many times that you are unimportant, that your personhood is insignificant, that your opinions do not matter, that the land does not belong to you, that your womanhood is subservient to white privilege and to white women's fragility. It is a contemplative silence, the silence where you learn about things that you didn't know, the silence where you introspect on your personhood, the silence that makes you think before you speak and think before you act, the silence that teaches us to respond before we react, and a silence that is directed towards both the interior and the exterior, the one that sits in silent and important, powerful contemplation, a flame, a presence that doesn't need to announce itself to be known, to be tangible, to be audible, to be visible. It is a kind of silence that shows that we will never speak our way into somebody's opinion. It is a silence that is devoid of ego, what that has nothing to prove. It is intrinsically political because it is a silence which progress and rebellion are happening concurrently. This is the silence, I believe, that Maison Denis Obukwe was residing in. And it's an important silence because there are many types of silences, my Africa. They are the silences of unnaming, like the unnamed South Africa yet to be Azania. They are the silences of namelessness, uh, like a Northwest province, like an Eastern Cape. They are the silences of false naming. Thousands and thousands of our mothers and our fathers who were named and misnamed. So a, a person who was Zamekaya now becomes Ujon, as somebody who was supposed to be called and Domientle becomes Uruf. The false naming of and, and renaming that is a, 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 that that actually um, immobilizes us. A silence that takes away our personhood. 
a silence that in fact is, is intended to cause us to forget ourselves and to, ref to actually reflect on the false naming as the real naming. The silences of omission, the silences of lying, the silences that lie and say that it is well when it is not, the silences that pretend that the lie of the rainbow nation is actually something that is believable beyond a fairy tale, that suggests in fact that this is one South Africa. The silence and the lie of renaming us and saying Simunye in a terrible grammatically wrong language and mislanguaging. And yet we know that we are fractured into thousands of pieces and that that fracturedness is the result of compromise, is the result of a negotiated settlement which has left all of us quite, quite unsettled, particularly the African majority. And in this misallocation of naming comes also the misallocation of glory or significance that belonged as though some were given another section of, 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 of history, another section of placing, another section of valorization. And this is also in line with the very masculinist, egocentric officializing of history. I've called, I've spoken many times about the ANCification of history. And one could say the Zanofication of history, the Swapification of history, as though there were no others. So indeed, under those circumstances, that kind of silence must be broken. And the kind of silence where men have muffled women's voices and writing and some of the many ways that women have struggled and continue to struggle to tell stories, people like our program director, Ndiki um, Mazwai, and her very creative sisters, the many people and the many women who are trying to tell um, new ways of new her stories, critiquing the kind of official dom that has us all captive recording our stories and our her stories, publishing our truths, not only with the written word, but with the spoken word, creating networks and even revising our languages. And women have been silenced into ridicule, enforcement of family hierarchies, male controlled media, anti-woman educational policies that make women's bodies political battlegrounds, censorship, racism, state-led imperialism. And yet in all of this, Mezondeni silence must be viewed as something that is transgressive. Silence sometimes suggests that there is something that is happening beneath I am a foreign student of memory, and I would like to suggest here that the scraps of memory that we have are often incubated in silence. Memory and the silencing of the things that are uncomfortable versions of that memory is a continued um, instrument of oppression and a continued instrument of dememorialization and the complete denuding of authentic memory, including in this country. And in that regard, I say proclamation is a part of memory as we are proclaiming Mezondeni today. The right to speak and to speak against the state is inherent and it is important, but the right to silent dissent, I argue, is equally important and one that women like Mesobukwe used to great effect sometimes as a survival strategy and sometimes in silent, uh, pregnant mockery. And the choice that I have made, for example, in my personal life, not to sing De Stem. Please catch me singing De Stem and know that that was not me. Represents my own right to silent dissent to reject the capitulation to narrow Africanodom. And that to me is my version of nation building, Azanian nation building. And silence in those moments is absolutely necessary in as much as some would view it as transgressive. So Mezondeni silence is an act of resistance, silence as dissident power 
to laugh in the face of power and say silently, I oppose you and to assert your power has no authority over me. It is a refusal that, that power authorizes force. And as such, this, this, this reflection maintains the closer inspection of the relationship between Mezondeni's supposed silence and the power of that silence. Because that silence works out a new space for new theories of the political, where that power is not disavowed, it is merely concealed. In this era of conspicuous, um, flamboyant politics, it is almost impossible to conceive of silence as being deeply revolutionary and deeply transgressive, as well as being an act of power, taking power. Bear in mind, um, uh, Africa, Amakle, that silence was a resistance to torture, a commitment not to break rank, a commitment not to break revolutionary codes of ethics. These methods were used by the state and continue, quite frankly, in different ways to be used by the state and different states by constant misnaming, renaming, physical threats to those who resist state power and state hegemony. We are not the only ones who have had to deal with utilizing silence as a weapon of transgression. Just a few years ago, there were Chilean women who embarked on a march of silence, protesting against the inequality again in the country and protesting against the historic, the historic violences against women and women's bodies, the historic and in many cases unresolved disappearances of many, many people and many, many children under Pinochet. Some of these silences have been held and these silent protests have been held for 40 years. And even now, as they wrestle with the findings of their version of a Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission, which I pray has been more fruitful than the frivolous charade of cheapened black pain that we were subjected to in the 1990s, they are still dealing with the reckoning of historic social uprising that has been sparked and reignited by moments of thousands of women gathering in collective, potent, intentional silence. So this notion of Mezopsopukwe being the silent one, the quiet one, we have to quantify the meaning of silence, the quality of that silence and the power in that silence, the power that it conveys. People who are of a more robust personality might find it very difficult to contain themselves under such difficult situations and circumstances. And the thing with being, with being told and being inscripted as somebody who is silent is that it also means that in that we also invisibilize a person. And visibility is key to the way that we construct memory and our story and her story and Mesobukwe's story. It is key to the notion of human dignity. It is key to the notion of reasserting the centrality of a voice which doesn't even speak very often. And this notion of silence, particularly in the context of Mesobukwe, is particularly problematic and particularly um, complicated and particularly poignant. Because in a sense, this notion of silence and silencing cannot be spoken of without the coexisting silence of Mangaliso Sobukwe. So even though his words have not been captured for posterity, and his voice has been deliberately silenced, as, 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 as the director Miki Dube has said, even though we are still shielded from his thoughts and his bold philosophy, and even though today there is no film footage or recordings of his voice and his speech, he speaks loudly. He is the loudest person other than alongside Mezondeni, even in this room. And I'd like to believe that, in fact, just as the elder 
that Patrice Lumumba's tooth has been excavated. Oh, my Africa. I pray, I believe, I hope that somewhere on this planet, there is a voice, there is a recording of Ndate Prof, which perhaps somebody will expose in the same way. Because such things, that little tooth eventually weighed down this Belgian soldier. He had to release it. The ancestors were breathing on him. So I am hoping that in the same way that somebody, the spirit of God is breathing on somebody on this planet. So this notion of, of silence in the context of Mesobukwe is very poignant because it's almost, you know, it's, it's, it's almost as though she's conjoined with Ndata Prof's other own silencing and invisibilizing. And with visibility comes remembrance and remembering is memory. And in some sense, when we remember, then we must also remember injustice. Memory makes the past present and it makes possible for the past to be addressed in this present and in the future. And while the flaws of memory have long been studied and well documented, this country has been extremely good at manipulating the politics of memory and the politics of just memory, the, policy, the politics of justice and memory. And what comes with that? Recognition, visibility, monuments, statutes, airports, um, pensions, and so on and so forth. So it is extremely important not to underplay the connection between silence and power, power and visibility, visibility and voice, and to recognize that in all of these things, we can be heard even in that silence as the Sobukwes are. Another complicating factor of Mesobukwe's identity, of her persona, of her being, of her personhood, is one that, of course, we wrestle with when we speak about who is a soldier, who is a, a combatant. And, and, and I think that this concept, the conception of what military activity is, when we speak of African liberation struggles in, in particular, but when we speak of many liberation struggles across the world, it creates this strange, sharp distinction between a soldier and a civilian and this dichotomy between who is at war and who is not. Because, of course, in our minds, we have decided that a combatant is this homogenous experience of a man in, a, in, in fatigues with a, with a rifle or AK-47 looking extremely soldierly and out there on behalf of the people, right, on the front line. We understand very much, especially um, in the global South or the majority world, we understand that combat is much more complicated than that. We understand that war is a much more complicated, multidimensional construct than that. War does not only happen in war fields somewhere. War happened in our communities. War happened in townships. And the thing, the apartheid struggle, the apartheid colonial resistance happened across borders. It happened in Angola, it happened in Swaziland, it happened in Lesotho, it happened in Zambia, it happened in so-called Southern Rhodesia, it happened in Mozambique. That is Mara Machel was blown up partly as a result of his resistance um, to the apartheid settler regime at, just after signing the Incomati Accord. It happened in Tanzania. It happened in Nigeria. Anywhere where we were, the war was happening. So this notion that war could be, the, the war, and thus who is a soldier and a combatant, can be localized and situated to one place where a few people are running around with guns is very problematic and does such a deep disservice to the many women of struggle including Mezo and Denis Obukwe. It does disservice to the women of Zimbabwe. It does disservice to the women of Angola. It does disservice to the women, um, to, the, to, 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 the, to the women who, who were fighting oppression, um, English imperialism in Northern Ireland. It does a great disservice to many women across Latin America who have resisted different forms of repression. So this notion of a distinction between a civilian and a combatant 
and that women make tea and that this is the great contribution. And by the way, making tea is sometimes an act of great transgression. Make no mistake about it. But it is not, it, we cannot be, the contribution of people like Imezo and Denny cannot be localized and situated only in that context. And it's also complicated by the fact that the apartheid state didn't even want to acknowledge itself as being at war. The apartheid state described itself in the 70s as engaging in a total onslaught, preferring to refer, referring to its enemies as terrorists rather than declaring an outright war. And various scholars have said that the choice for the apartheid state to define the conflict as unrest or as terrorism, as opposed to war, implied that the liberation movement fighters were denied prisoner of war status granted by the Geneva Conventions to those who were engaged in war against colonial powers. And this makes it all the more sickening that in, 19, in 2022, there are men who are growing old in South African jails, in a supposedly African state, who are growing old, having fought for so-called liberation. They are effectively prisoners of war to a compromised neoliberal Western colonized state. So it is so crucial that when we think about this notion of who was a soldier, we need to situate people like Mam Sobukwe exactly as a combatant, in a quiet way, in a silent way, but a combatant nonetheless. If this also links to this notion of this link between soldiering and, and, and masculinity also is, is, you know, is also very difficult to, to, dis, to dissect because the military, as one scholar has said, is even more patriarchal than other patriarchal institutions and no more and no less than even our own liberation forces, which were responsible for some atrocities against women, women's bodies. But that said, this also means that um, questions of state-assisted reintegration, questions of how then to, to create an enabling environment for transition back into civilian life is extremely complicated when one's soldierhood and when the war zone has been our own community. The war zone has been our own, our own neighborhood. And people who were watching pictures in the 1970s and 80s of South, African, of, of South African liberation have always noted that this was a very special, different kind of liberation, which had to take place internally as well as in some distant camps. But we, rem we will romanticize those who were in jail. We romanticize those over there who were in the camps. And we underestimate and downplay the role, the revolutionary, in, 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 um, in, um, the revolutionary, transgressive, and very, very difficult role of those who were supposedly keeping the home fires burning. When those homes were literally on fire, townships were on fire, it was difficult to just keep the home fires burning. Constant interrogation reduced employment opportunities, ostracization. It was so difficult to be in the home fires. No one wants to talk about post-traumatic stress, my Africa. The stress of living through those circumstances and the stress of people who came back broken with nightmares, brutalized, traumatized. And what, you know, we wonder why in our social our social fiber is sometimes manifest so violently so toxically why people do such strange things some things that seem inhuman the levels of violence the levels of self violence and the levels of violence are amongst ourselves and we need to think about how, where, where we trace this from when we come from generations of people who grew up in absolutely abnormal times and we have done nothing we the state i should say has done nothing to demobilize to offer support to offer counseling
to offer all kinds of different psychosocial tools to have the honest conversations. Instead, massaging white liberal um, sensibilities, white capitalist interests, and negotiating away black people's anger because, oh no, it's all about the investors. So people like Maison Denny, we don't even understand the trauma they lived with. And I think that it's also important to really mention now what it even meant in those days to be banished um, Ma Africa. Because at the time, um, you know, the, 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 this, this whole notion of being banished was something that we, I think hasn't been theorized specifically enough and hasn't been popularized enough. And for the people who were in between, and I think I want to paint a picture of what it meant at that time, whether banishment by legislation, like Menomzamo, um, Matigizela, or whether banishment by public and political uh, notoriety, like Mrs. Ntiki Biko, and like Mrs. Zondeni Sobukwe. And you know, remember that during this time, those who were resisting tyranny, they were killed, they were assassinated. When we speak of trauma, of what could happen to a person, like a Mesobukwe, they were hanged, they were imprisoned, they were banned, they were detained, they were deported, they were endorsed in and out of urban areas. They were forcibly removed, they were forced to flee into exile, like some of us, but others were forced to flee or were banished into exile. And in those early er years of apartheid, political appointments from rural er um, areas were condemned to live to the living hell of banishment. And this was an administrative weapon used to expel opponents to distant, often arid, desolate places for unlimited play for unlimited period. You'd often find that a person is is sent to a place where they don't even have family, friends, nothing, an emotional desert a psychological concentration camp, as it were, a place where even linguistically you'll be tossed somewhere to Venda. You don't speak Chivenda. You are a Kosa. You are tossed somewhere to Keza. You, you are tossed somewhere to, to Blumfande. You don't speak Sisutu. And, you know, that cognitive violence, that psychological violence, which, of course, was not, nothing was, in, you know, was accidental with, imperial, with, imper with the imperial powers, right? But I want us to paint this picture, Ma Africa, of what it meant when opponents were plucked from their families and cast to the most abandoned parts of the country. What did it do to those who were plucked and what did it do to those who remained? Would you not also remain silent as a result of that and think to yourself, you know, there are many ways to state my case. There are many ways to fight this war and there are many ways to resist this brutality. And just to paint a picture, between 1948 and 1986, at least 150 men and 10 women were banished, of whom 140 were from um, rural areas. And bear in mind that those who were left behind, Ma Africa, were left to deal with suspicion, derision, and sometimes nervous sympathy. Others were castigated for the actions of their loved ones. None of this represents the soft life of having tea parties as the ones who were keeping the home fires burning, of prayer meetings and leisurely repose reading books. Banishment, banishment was absolutely brutal. Whether it was formal banishment or whether it was the kind of banishment that people like Mrs. Biko and Mrs. Sobukwe had to deal with. And bear in mind that this was actually presided over by Imperial Britain. You know, the, Britain has a lot to answer for. It's a long, long red carpet of bloodstained sins that they have yet to answer for and account for. Maybe this little heat wave is partly part, part of um, the, the, the spirit's um, applying some pressure on them, who knows? But I think that it's also important to say that not only were people like Mrs. Sobukwe then 
in these hostile times, you are the you are you are married to a notorious figure who is banished. What are you eating? What are you drinking? How are your children going to school? Living on charity and the largesse of the community. And it was, you know, being a widow of the revolution, my Africa. Widowhood is an extremely complex construct, especially in African communities. It's extremely complicated. It, is, it, 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 it comes with baggage, it comes with um, heaviness, it carries weight, it carries spiritual significance. Widowhood is sometimes viewed as something that a woman has performed. You did this. You, cost, you, you, you caused this as a wrath of the ancestors. I want to us to paint this picture of what Mrs. Sobukwe was contending with, my Africa far beyond just being the, 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 the bridesmaid to the struggle. And that it is also, it, it, it changes things. It changes into personal relationships. It sometimes changes the places you can go, how you are named, how you identified, your capacity to even draw an income, your capacity to work while you are grieving. And yet there are mouths to feed, there are things to do. And many times, some people are left destitute when they lose their husbands, especially political widows, my Africa. Widows are often deprived of financial support from traditional sources, which can cause economic hardship and deprivation. I am reminded of Queen Mother Betty Shabazz, who, of course, was Malcolm X's widow, among many other of her own subsequent accomplishments, who was only saved from destitution by the publication of Alex Haley's book on Malcolm X, to which he, in his own revolutionary act, assigned her half of those royalties. Otherwise, can you imagine being the widow of Malcolm X in the late 1960s? Can you imagine what would have become of her and those many six of those six children, six daughters? So I think in all of this, it's so important, uh, my Africa, to reframe this notion of what wifeism means in the context of struggle, what mothering means in the context of struggle. And indeed, I think many people, many writers, um, like my good friend in Tabisen Mutseme, who says that what these things do is that they hide life, township life under apartheid. They hide um, the effects on families, and in particular, the effects on women and children, which are completely ignored. And they often lo locate women in the identity of a mother and of a domestic wife as the faithful supporter, not the standalone woman, but the faithful supporters of their more valiant husbands which is such a discredit to women like Medim Pohani, a firebrand of a woman, a firebrand of a woman. And I encourage anybody who has never spent time with her, please, she's one of our few living um, ancestors, a firebrand. We have lost Me Victoria Mashlomakulu, who is one of the people who delivered me in exile, another firebrand of a woman, a standalone woman. People like General Nomvoy Boy, people like Queen Mother Loretta Ngobo, people like Elizabeth Sibeko, people like Bibi Mutupi, people like Belede Mazwai, people like my own mother, Nancy Wapeku, who many people don't understand much about. But like all of these people, all of these women and her contemporaries, Maison Denis Sobukwe was an architect and co-creator of this liberation that we are sitting and casually sipping like Roy Bosch tea today, my Africa. Casually sipping like Roy Bosch tea. But I just want to say in closing that memory is not static. Memories are created and recreated. They are enforced every time we speak, we think, we look, and we breathe. This is a powerful thing 
that the Robert Sobukwe Trust is doing by forcing us to recreate repositories and shared recollections of who we are, who we were, and who we should be. And they don't research. They, these memories cannot belong to a single stream of consciousness, nor can they be overly masculinized. I want to suggest that, in fact, somebody like Mezo Ndeni Sobukwe, in her role as a co thinker and a co conspirator, perhaps the reason that she, other than her, her, her immense medical expertise, um, when she requested uh, to the apartheid regime that she join Ndade uh, Mangaliso on the island, not only because to nurse him, but also because she thought to herself, maybe she thought to herself, let me go and also break those rocks. Because by the way, this is also my mess. I am half of this mess. And I, 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 I have to say this again and again, she is half of a brain's trust of the Azanian liberation. And I think that I, you know, this memory has to be treated not just as a, as a product, as a chief commodity to enforce masculinized party politicized state power. But it is absolutely the opportunity for us to celebrate and to come against the state-led curation of who we are and who we were. It is important that we cannot continue to exile, as I've written before, certain memories, certain ideologies, including the role of women like Mesobukwe and the Azanian cause. We have to continue to diligently theorize, diligently celebrate, diligently comm commemorate, diligently complicate the lives of women warriors like Mesobukwe. In closing, I want to say to the women warriors whom I stand with, the ones who came before, and the ones who will come behind like my daughters, that there is a fire inside you. There is enough fire inside you to put all of hell to shame, but you are pretending to be water. For someone who is too afraid to handle the dragons in your belly, stop crushing the thing that makes you. Embrace the flames. Be whole again for yourself and no one else. Thank you, my Africa. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Osle Bukhang. That was most inspiring. I see the page pages are going crazy, crazy, crazy. There's a fire on social media from that. It's been beautiful, beautiful. We can come so in Denise's spirit. We had a party on her behalf. It was beautiful. Thank you so much to Prof Gordon Zide for, for uh, inviting us. And, uh, and making sure that this program is put together for us to celebrate Kawega's led to Siabulela for the warm, warm invitation. Umam Nonobe, thank you so, so much for that poetic rendition, for bringing the spirits into the room and making sure that the program gets seen through in our spiritual way. Thank you so much to Professor Sipo Shabalala, our elder. <laughs> Our veteran, thank you from your river of wisdom so, so much to our key note. Most inspiring, most to obviously the Robert Mangalis. Thank you to Utando at uh, Afrique de Police. <laughs> Thank you so much for making sure that this program comes together. I believe it was successful. Thank you for to the speakers for taking your time to come and feed us the youth. Thank you guys. We'll see you again next time. Thank you. Thank you. And please do share this um, conversation on all your social media platforms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.